Benvenuti a tutti all'MLOps Community Coffee Session, sono Valerio Velardo e in questo podcast parleremo di come l'MLOps può essere applicata all'audio e alla musica. Ciao a tutti! All right, ciao, we're back with another edition of the MLOps Community Podcast. As you heard there in Italian, we are talking today to Valerio Velardo. He is an AI music consultant. He also is the host of The Sound of AI on YouTube. You can go check out that channel. They've got like 22,000 subscribers. If you haven't seen it already, it's incredible to geek out on everything AI and music. And he is also the MLOps lead at a little company called Utopia Music. So today we started out by geeking out on all things music and then going into AI generative music and what that looks like. Then we started to discuss some of the challenges of working with R&D teams and bringing their products into production. I had all kinds of great takeaways on this. He was preaching to the choir for like 90% of this uh, podcast because he was saying things that I know we talk about so much in the MLOps community Slack. Speaking of which, if you are not in that, I highly recommend you join and start chiming in on some of these threads. And also, one other thing that I will ask of you before we finish is that if you are not already subscribed to this podcast, please hit the uh, subscribe button. Leave us a review if you have that opportunity on Apple Music or Apple Podcasts, whatever they call it these days. And if you're listening on Spotify, you can give us ratings. You can give us like a five-star rating or a five and a half star. I don't know if they make that, but we should talk to some Spotify people and tell them to get that so that we can get that five and a half star rating. And it would be a huge help for us if you hit that five-star rating and you just let Spotify know that we're awesome. All right. That's all I got for now. Let's jump into this conversation with Valerio. Hope you enjoy. So I think in an alternate universe, we could be brothers. Considering our love for music, our long hair, and our facial hair. Uh, absolutely long hair, yeah. Uh, there is a different reality where we grew up together and we were playing music together. Where did your love for music come from? Well, it started really, really early because I was taking piano performance lessons. I mean, since I was probably five or six. So I started there, continued that career for quite a long time, got a, a degree, postgraduate degree as well, like in piano performance, and then oh, wow. just moved to um, music composition, classical composition, as well as conducting. So it's been sort of thing that has grown within me for a long time. And I mean, it's probably the thing that I loved the most. So the, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting field. And it's also a way of exploring many different things in a interdisciplinary way, because music brings in a sort of mathematical side so you can study music analyze music yeah. through mathematics through computing and then there's also the artificial intelligence aspect that's super interesting analyzing music or audio using uh computing um processes and artificial intelligence but also generating music so for me it's really a i have to say it's really a a dream come true, bringing together all of this different sides. Yeah. yeah, there is something super interesting. And I think a lot of people who don't play music don't understand that uh, when you learn one instrument, picking up another instrument is not as hard because you already know it sounds good. You understand that C, G and F are going to go well together, whether you're playing it on a piano or on a guitar or on a lute, right? It, doesn't matter what the instrument is if you can get that basis and that basis like you were talking about can really be explored through mathematics and you you basically went really deep learning how to be a composer learning how to compose things and 
what I'm wondering next is where did the computer science and then AI and machine learning get into this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I finished high school, I had to decide which career to take. And of course, music was one big thing and I continued with that. But at the same time, I decided to go for something a little bit more on the scientific side. So I studied physics and astrophysics and there... I also got super interested into computer science and programming. I've been hacking since I was a teen, really, right? And I've also been fascinated by uh, the mind, the brain, and the way we think. And I have to say that this had a lot to do in terms of picking up also artificial intelligence and studying that, right? So the, the, the cognitive science that's behind it, as well as the the philosophy, if you will. It's something that has always fascinated me and I've been studying it for decades now, really. Mm. So, and I've been studying artificial intelligence, playing around with it for a very long time since I was a teen, really. And of course, at that time, it wasn't really machine learning. It was more yeah. symbolic AI. And that's something that I really treasure quite a lot because studying that type of artificial intelligence gave me sort of very good understanding of the field and the possibilities. Whereas right now, it seems to me that all the buzz is only with machine learning, which is great, by the way. And of course, I'm a big proponent of that. But for example, for music, you also want to know about the old stuff, the good old fashioned uh, AI, so all the generative grammars, all the Markov models, all the uh, expert-based systems and things like that. So these are fundamental assets that you have that you can use to generate music. And generating music really was the thing that brought me the most into this fascinating uh, world, really. And then after I sort of like finished my degrees, postgraduate degrees, I decided to continue. And at that point, I had a choice to make. So will I continue being a mania musician? Will I continue mainly being a scientist? Uh, but then I thought, well, perhaps I should try to bring those things together. And that's when I decided to do a PhD in the space, so AI music at the University of Huddersfield in England. And it's been a heck of a journey there, really. And so I grown my skills so much uh, into like all of this different sides, into research and my understanding of music has been sort of complemented by my understanding of the computing side of things and vice versa. And so this is such a thrilling experience. So I know there's a ton of use cases that you have been playing around with when it comes to audio we, we just talked about audio generation and we talked about before we hit record the ideas of basically producing with machine learning and there are many ways that we can go but I think it's probably helpful for the listeners to narrow down what exactly we're talking about and where you have been experimenting with machine learning. Yes, of course. So first of all, I think it's probably fair to give a little bit of an introduction about AI music. So what's AI music? Of course, it's sort of subfield, if you will, of artificial intelligence and that focuses on music. And I've been playing around mainly with a music AI, AI music, but also with other types of um, sounds and artificial intelligence applied, uh, applied to, for example, environmental sound or to speech. And this is sort of the same family, but the, that subfamily, if you will, of AI then branches, branches out into music AI, environmental sound AI, and speech recognition, speech processing, if you will, right? What do you but, mean by environmental sound AI? Environmental sound is basically like all the sounds that you can hear, for example, in your room, if I don't know, like something breaks, like the windows break uh, or uh, something else. So when you're out on the street and you have the sound of the city, really. And so there are a bunch of tasks there, like, for example, recognizing what's going on, audio scene classification, for example, right? 
So you have a scene, so you, you are, for example, out in the wild and you want to know whether like there's a, I don't know, like a siren going by or whether like someone is shooting. And so, I mean, it's all that type of sound that's not speech and that's not music, if you will. All the environmental sounds that we are immersed in, right? And all of these type of sounds, music, environmental sound and speech are quite different in nature. Even though some of the techniques that we use to crack them, to analyze them or to produce them are the same, but there are many things that are specific to each of this, right? So it's important that you really specialize, that you really have a deep understanding of how like these different sounds differ, right? So how music is different from normal, like sounds, noises and things like that. And that is different from speech because that is gonna help you out quite a lot in um, in your day-to-day -day tasks that you have to uh, apply or just like to carry out with AI. Now, let's go back to AI music. Okay, mm -hmm. so within AI music, we have two big branches. So one is using artificial intelligence or more, not necessarily AI, but any sort of computation, even DSP, digital signal processing, for extracting information from music. Like for example, you have some music, you have a, an audio file of a piece of music, and you want to understand the chords that you have in that piece of music. So you want to recognize chords, or you want to separate the tracks into different instruments, vocals, yeah. drums, bass, guitar, piano, for example. Another task could be at a higher level, understanding the emotion of the music, right? Yeah. Is this music happy? Is it sad? Or another sort of task that we have, it, always in the recognition type of application is music genre recognition. Mm -hmm. So you analyze a, an audio file and you decide whether that is progressive rock music or if it's classical Baroque music or if it's, I don't know, like a Renaissance music. Right. So in this sphere of AI music, you use computational means. It could be machine learning. It could be DSP. It could be good old fashioned AI to uh, recognize and to extract information from the music itself. Then we have the other big branch, and this is the one that excites me the most. And I've in my life, like this is what, it, what this is like the, the, the sort of like task where I've put all, most of my energy into, and that's music and sound generation. So this is the flip side of analyzing music. So you analyze music, you extract information, and then you leverage that information to build uh, generative music algorithms. And there you can use all sorts of AI techniques and, no, and non-AI techniques at the same time to generate music. And this is so exciting because at this level, you not only create something or create an algorithm that can carry out something very complex, but at the same time, something that is super subjective and ambiguous and difficult to, to define something like music that's so complex and so ambiguous, right, in nature. And uh, within like this other branch uh, of AI music, we have a bunch of different tasks. Like for example, generating a melody, a simple melody, right? Or generating chord progressions, giving, given a certain melody. So that this would be a sort of accompaniment as well, right? Or you can, could actually generate sound, right? So you could generate uh, sound uh, or samples or loops that then producers can use to have completely crazy sound that's at the edge between, I don't know, uh, a piano sound and a drum sound, right? Things yeah. that are not possible to generate with other means, unless you use, I don't know, some crazy variational autoencoder or stuff like that, right? And this is really what excites me the most because there within generative music, and uh, like other people like named this like music meta 
creation or mm -hmm. algorithmic music sometimes there there are little differences but in academia more or less like they are i would say like they are the same right so you use algorithms more or less sophisticated to generate musical output so i think like this is really the most interesting aspect uh, of or fields or subfields of ai music because it allows you to bring together a bunch of different things so music theory music cognition computer science, AI, DSP. So, so yeah. talk to me a little bit about the traditional ML life cycle within music tech companies, because I know that we do, we do want to dive into like how ML ops plays a role in all of this and how academia looks at it, how the industry is starting to leverage it. What have you seen? I know that you've talked a bit about ML ops and and how audio, machine learning for audio or music or whatever we want to call it, has been implemented. But what do you see there? What have you been noticing? Yeah, I've been noticing, yeah, first of all, I have to say that uh, MLOPs or like the machine learning like lifecycle hasn't been really prioritized that well within music tech companies, unless we're talking about big companies. So the one that I'm... Uh, working for right now, so Utopia or Spotify. So here, right. So th the ML lifecycle is done almost <laughs> the proper way, or we are actually building things to have it done the proper way. Mm. But in the case of startup companies or smaller companies, really, I have to say that we, you don't have a proper ML ops pipeline there. And in terms of the ML lifecycle, I have to say that most of the things uh, that you would apply to like natural language processing or to image uh, processing still do apply within music and audio processing. But there are some caveats, right? We're dealing with a type of data that's really different in nature. Audio is its own best, right? And this means that all those aspects of the ML life cycle, like for example, data wrangling, data ingestion, data validation, and especially data pre-processing have their own special, I would say, um, application within audio, right? And that's because the amount of work that you have to put to transform this data and the amount of knowledge that you have to have in order to transform this data into a representation that's meaningful enough for your machine learning algorithms, it has to be very fast, right? And that's like something like very specific to uh, AI audio and AI music more particularly. And are you talking like the information that you need to have, like that subject ma matter expertise it's just knowing the frequencies that certain instruments land in, or are you talking about something deeper? Yeah, I'm talking about the type of representation that your data should have. The problem with audio data is that if you're dealing with raw audio, so for example, a wave file, right? So this is highly, highly dimen dimensional. It's very difficult to take a, like a very long piece of raw audio and pass it into a deep learning model because mm -hmm. the dimensionality is enormous. So there are a lot of techniques to transform this data that has very high dimensionality into something that's more manageable, into sequences, time series that are a little bit more manageable for uh, our deep learning and machine learning models. So to give you a couple of examples here, right? So what we would usually do is we would take a WAV file and rather than dealing with the WAV file itself and pass it into a transformer, whatever that may be, we would actually extract certain music features, like for example, spectrogram or melt spectrogram. And you would use certain transformations that come directly from uh, digital signal processing, right? Like for example, a Fourier transform. You would use a Fourier transform so that you can get a uh, sort of like a spectrogram out of that, or you would use also like some sort of like um, 
uh, filter, filter banks and things like that so that you can get a spectrogram and reduce it to something that's even more semantically meaningful from a perceptual point of view, transforming a spectrogram into a MEL spectrogram. And that would be basically by applying certain like MEL filter banks, which would kind of reshape your spectrograms in such a way that uh, the, 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 the results that you have, the representation that you have is more perceptually meaningful. And this is something that we want to pass down to, to the model. In other words, we need to have representations of the audio that's meaningful enough and at the same time that's compact enough so that the, the models can handle this information. And this is a large research topic at the moment because there are a few of these representations and this have been changing over time. So back in the day, we were dealing with a, with a lot of features, really. So yeah. zero crossing rate, loudness, um, a bunch, Envelope. really. Yeah. Envelope, whatever, really, right? Yeah. But now the idea is to use something a little bit more... Uh, row in a sense, like a spectrogram or male spectrograms. But at some point, we also passed through another very specific representation that's called MFCCs, so male frequency sepstral coefficients. And so this is something, this is a feature that has been engineered looking at or taking into consideration how we create speech. And it's quite fascinating because there are a lot of transformations that are modeled around our vocal tracts, right? And all of these things have been done to move from something very amorphous and ambiguous and very highly dimensional like a wave file into something that's slow, kind of like lower dimensional and at the same time carries a lot of perceptual information, right? And yeah, so this is something that continues quite a lot and the, the research for even better audio and music representation. And this is why I think like audio processing, music processing is something so peculiar and you have to have a set of skills that are quite unique in order to work in this space. Well, talk to me how you see it being better served how the market especially when you're talking about how there's not the strongest ml ops practices right now in this space how do you see that being better served and i know that when you say the audio space there's not strong ml ops practices in this we could just as easily generalize that to the whole space of machine learning and say there's not the strongest or the clearest cut definition of how things should be but in your eyes, when you've seen it work, what does it look like? Okay. Yeah, I think this is a very, very uh, good question. And I think uh, it really depends on uh, the, the company, I would say, right? So when I consult companies, depending on the, on the size that they have, I have two different approaches. So if I'm approached by a small startup, what I suggest is to have a single, uh, I would say, team that handles AI audio or AI music. And in the process, this team should be able to do a couple of things. So one, doing R&D research, and then shifting to, to productization, to production, right? And so th the way I suggest it, most of the time is that you would usually start with some sort of like prototype, right, of an AI music application, for example, spend one, two months maximum there. And then once you have like something minimal that works, it could be super spaghetti code. Yeah, we really don't care that much at this point, right? We need something that proves that the thing that we are trying to build actually works to a certain extent, right? Then when you hit like this initial step, then move on to prioritization. So actually there, try to write the best code you can, follow the best practices you can, follow clean code practices, follow, create your infrastructure 
And this is something so overlooked right now within the uh, the industry that's incredible, right? So everyone seems to be focused on the, the research itself, the R&D, but they don't realize that the real problems and challenges most of the time come from the other side, which is getting like this amazing initial prototype that you have and putting it into uh, production. And so for oh, that, yeah. I usually suggest these companies, these small companies, to then spend at least the same amount of time that they spent on prototyping to productizing their uh, their work. And in the process, also building an infrastructure there. So what does an MLOps infrastructure mean at this point? For me, it means that you should have a pipeline that allows you to reproduce and expand whatever like experiments you created and then to scale them up. Of course, you're not going to build the whole pipeline in a couple of months, but you start with a with an initial uh, bit of it. Like for example, I don't know, like the, the experiment, training, tracking experiments, tracking uh, models, having a central model registry so that all the data scientists, uh, AI, music people can actually have access to all the experiments rather than searching frantically through a bunch of, <laughs> of directories there where you just dumped all of your uh, experiments and you have no idea what those experiments are because you completely forget about that after a couple of weeks, right? And then you have to move on. You have to build something that uh, helps you to automate the evaluation process and then the deployment process as well, so that by the end of this process, you're going to have a nice little pipeline that allows you to train your model, experiment with your model, then doing automatic evaluation and automatic uh, deployment. And in the specific case of music processing, if these people are handling uh, audio files, what I suggest doing is building a framework that allows them to sort of transform all of their audio data quite nicely and in a simple manner with a very nice high level API so that you can easily read all the data that you want and then you can transform it, for example, in a uh, mail spectrogram with a very simple API that's common across the whole um, a company. Because usually what I've seen happening is that all the, so if you have a team of four or five people, sometimes each of these uh, persons is just working on a project by him or herself. And the problem is that they're reinventing the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. And this is such a waste of time and resources. And by the way, you're not even sure that what they're doing is actually correct because most of the time, data scientists, I am afraid to say, are not great coders. And yeah, I have a little bit like, uh, of, I'm quite opinionated like on that, right? But I prefer to have something that's centralized and that works well in terms of like creating these transformations that are so fundamental. So if you get these things wrong, then you have all of your experiments that are completely garbage. And I've seen this uh, sort of like rubbish experiment happening time and again. And people who had to just like take and throw out months of work because they were just doing things to go fast, but then actually they didn't go fast. They just wasted a lot, a lot of time. But this is like for small startups. If I can add something about like larger companies, I think yeah. what's extremely important there is to have two teams, right? And that's definitely like something that happens within like scale apps or, or should happen within scale apps and enterprises. So one team that's dedicated mainly on the R and D side and another one that's the more engineering side of things. So there you have your ML eng engineers or ML uh, ops, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. But, and these two worlds have to talk to each other and the ML ops team should be a sort of developer for the needs of the R&D team. And this is something extremely powerful to have. So you have an MLOps team who's going to go 
and do a lot of like customer discovery. So it's as if like this was its own little startup, right? Doing customer discovery, talking to the R&D team or teams, because sometimes in big companies, like the one that I'm working for, Utopia, so you can have machine learning within a bunch of different business units. In our case, it's more than 10, 15 business units, right? And you have to serve them all, right? And the best approach there probably is just to treat yourself as a startup and know that your customers are all of these other teams within uh, the company and then go there and do what you would do if you were actually a startup, having customer discovery processes, approaching the whole thing using a, uh, a Lean method methodology to where you mm -hmm. just build something, you talk to your customer, you experiment with that and you go back once you get your feedback so that you can improve in a very agile manner. So yeah, I think like these are the two main approaches. One question that tends to come up on here, especially when you're talking about how building a platform for a large team or various teams and making that centralized place is what metrics do you look at as far as success metrics? Is it speed to deployment? Is it uh, happiness of the R&D team? What kind of hard metrics do you tend to view as the most important things? And of course, this is in each specific use case, it's going to have its own thing. But for you, what, what ha have you found to be very insightful metrics? I think something that's really useful for me, at least, is to look at the number of use cases that we can cover within this centralized platform, right? Because, mm. of course, you're starting from scratch, right? And then it takes time to build all of that infrastructure that's necessary for actually serving all of those uh, different teams. And if you are within a big company with a lot of teams that you're serving, they may be doing work that's very specialized, that's very different from one another. And that probably, I would say, sometimes you, you also have teams that use different, uh, even ML libraries, right? So there's someone who's using PyTorch, someone else who's using, I don't know, like TensorFlow or Keras, right? Now, a metric that I think like it's very important, at least in the first stages, is to just understand how much of the, or how many of the current use cases you can cover with what you're building, right? And if you try to optimize that, you probably try, you, you, you will try to have the most valuable components of your platform built uh, first, rather than building like something that's super fancy, super interesting for you, you would rather focus on things that are useful for these people, right? But of course, like this is a, this is a metric that can be broken down into the different aspects that you have in a centralized ML platform. So it could be, for example, the models that you can automatically build from configuration, right? So how many of those can you, can you build? So how many, uh, moving to, to another aspect, how many uh, of those models you can evaluate? So do you have enough evaluation metrics that cover like most of the most important uh, use cases out there. Same thing for uh, deployment, for monitoring. So this is something that I definitely keep in mind. And it's sort of, let's say, um, a compass, right? That uh, allows me just to, to find the, the right direction. And more than hard metrics, another thing that I find super useful is to have continuous talks, customer talks, really, with all of these teams, right? And understanding whether, so let, let's put it this way. So we organize our work in sprints, right? So at the beginning of a sprint, we talk with some of these teams. Of course, you can't talk with 20 teams every sprint, right? But with some of them, we get some feedback. And of course, we, we populate our backlog depending on the needs that we get, right? And then at the end of the sprint, we let them try out what we've built and see whether like what we've built actually addresses their problems, right? Mm -hmm. And this continuous talk allows you first to pass the mentality that 
productizing data science code, right, or spaghetti code, is something extremely important also for an R&D team. And at the same time, keeps the channels open so that you can feel whether you're going in the right direction or not. So yeah, I would say some hard metrics mixed with a lot of interpersonal skills that you have to put there to talk with people who, whose main mentality most of the time is creating something that works no matter what without looking or being interested in the productization part. And, oh man, I've got so many questions that I want to ask you on this one, but I think the m most interesting one will probably be what have been some challenges you have faced when going and talking to the R&D teams and then building something that they want? Oh, oh yeah, this, I have, <clears throat> I don't know, a very, very long list of things and challenges that I had. I imagined that's why. Yeah, I yeah, not, not just like uh, at my uh, yeah current uh, like job, but also as a consultant, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, R&D and productization, MLOps, if you will, like are two sides of the very same coin. But especially when you're talking to AI music researchers or data scientists, you realize that these people most of the time come from a very academic background. They're fantastic at doing research, but really don't care that much about uh, taking that research and converting it into a product. Many of them don't really even know the difference there. So sometimes when I, when I had chats with a junior developer, but even not developers, but AI music researchers or data scientists, however we want to call them. But even with senior ones, so you realize that they don't appreciate the importance of having clean code, scalable code, doing things that can be done in a repeatable way. So for me, this is something that I, that I see more or less every time I talk to a, an R&D team. So, this is probably the, the biggest challenge, to let them appreciate the importance of getting their fanciful models and converting them into something that can be productized, scaled up, scaled down, and uh, replicated quite easily. So this is probably the number one uh, problem that I have. And indeed, uh, also with my channel, YouTube channel, The Sound of AI, this is something that I trying to uh, raising awareness around, right? So letting AI music engineers or AI, in not engineers in this case, but researchers, I should say, or data scientists, <laughs> let them understand the importance of doing things the right way. And mm. this, this sentence or this expression, doing things the right way, is a huge kind of word, especially for people who are not used to that. Yeah, I think you're preaching to the choir and there are so many people that are listening that are cheering along with you right now <laughs> because this topic comes up time and time again in the community Slack. We've got a whole channel dedicated to it really called Production Code. And it's one of the most active channels that we have just because of this sentiment and recognizing that things need to be battle hardened if you want to put them into production. But, and a lot of people don't realize that. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree a hundred percent, but I think it's our role that of preaching sort of this lessons to the R and D side, right? Yeah. So we should go out and do a lot of knowledge transfer, right? And this is something that I do all the time because I think this is something that is going to be useful for everyone, right? So if the R&D, sorry. Well, yeah, I'm just wondering, like besides your YouTube channel, how do you go about that education process? What do you do to try and help yeah, so, people understand the value of it? Yeah, so first of all, I do that when I'm actively involved in a project and I am using the R&D team as a sort of um, customer of my team that's more focused on uh, productization or engineering, I would use 
all the chances that I have, in other words, the customer discovery uh, talks or the feedback talks uh, uh, to, to just like let them know the importance of production code. But this is more something of a casual thing. So it's more of a continuous habit, if you will. But there's then another aspect, which is just having workshops, right? They're having workshops. There, there's something that I'm trying to introduce right now at Utopia. That's a session that we're going to have every uh, couple of weeks. And that is going to be basically for people to, to just like chat about like the things that they like the most. And what I'd like to do is involving both the, the researchers as well as the engineers, right? And within that session, actually passing on this type of information regarding the importance of uh, production code, clean code, frameworks, and all of these sort of things. So... This is a way, but then there's also another way that's a little bit more uh, straightforward for me, which is, okay, so we're going to have some actual sessions regarding like machine learning operation, like what that is, how that is going to benefit you, and how you, data scientists, should be involved in the process to help you out with your experiments, with your fancy like models and research right yeah. and i think like this is the most important thing letting people know how much we can help right uh -huh. so this is probably the the the, the best sort of uh, strategy that we can have to convince people about like, the the importance itself of what we are doing right and keeping them in the loop not just thinking okay yeah these are data scientists these are researchers so, yeah they really don't care I don't care about them. They will talk to each other like the, the minimum amount of time possible yeah, and then we'll hate to. each other <laughs> the remaining part of the time. No, that's not the actual approach. And I can tell you, being a pers person who actually comes from both worlds, so the, the engineering side as well as the, the research, which, which is my main passion, really, it's important to letting them know, to keeping them in the loop and to share as much information as possible yeah well and i also imagine not only keeping them in the loop but letting them know what would be helpful and as you said how you can help and also what they can do to get that help or or make things easier on themselves or make things easier on everyone so i appreciate that you're setting up workshops to do that and you're trying to instill this kind of knowledge transfer into everyone in in these different positions. What I am also wondering is you have a ton of different use cases and I am going out on a limb here, but I don't think all of them are related to audio when it comes to how you're using machine learning. And so if you're building this centralized platform and let's say a majority of the use cases are for audio, but then you have other use cases, how do you rectify that situation right what do you look at are there building blocks and foundational blocks as you yes. mentioned before and then once you get more specialized how do you start looking at things yes absolutely i think that's spot on right my approach is super modular right and most of the time when i talk to uh, companies and i consult them of course the the main focus for them is audio music processing some sort of yeah, tasks like, I don't know, music genre classification, it could be music generation, whatever, right? But sometimes they do also have other use cases that perhaps are use like natural language or images or things like that, right? So how do I reconcile that? Well, the idea is to think of the machine learning platform that I'm building or framework that I'm building in terms of different modules, right? So I have like big modules, big components and then uh, I can that have like some kind of like high level interfaces, right? And then having some specialized modules within those components that I can just plug and play, right? So I'm going to take this platform, I'm going to divide it into like different components, like the, I don't know, like the configuration, training, evaluation, monitoring, tracking, whatever that may be. And then having specialized aspects for different use cases, right? In a, a kind of extendable 
uh, way so that you have this idea of having a plug and play approach, right? So you have all of these models, they, they somewhat respect a, an interface for a certain component or for whatever subcomponent they are kind of implementing. And then mm -hmm. you can swap these components and you can just take them out. Perhaps in my platform, I don't need evaluation or I don't need monitoring. I just need deployment, for example, right? So I'm going to build the platform in such a way that I can bring in more modules, bring out more modules. And at the same time, each module is going to be um, kind of respecting a certain interface. And by doing so, I'm going to be able to uh, also kind of like tap into different use cases with different types of data as well. So I could have processors that deal with audio and other processors that uh, deal yeah. only with, um, I don't know, like um, natural language, for example, right? Mm -hmm. As long as they follow the same interfaces, high level interfaces, I'm fine. So is that how it looks? Like you're declaring when you start a project or you're hopefully getting the R&D people to declare that I want these modu modular blocks and this is what I think this project needs. So I build my, my stack per se, and then I get to run it on that stack. Uh, yeah, I think it, it depends. Most of the time, if I have to say, probably the R and D people don't have the full picture, right? Of the different, uh, or how to organize those different blocks in a production ready manner. Right? Mm -hmm. So what I would do is first of all, talk to them, understand the use case itself, but then having a also like quite bottom up approach, right? So being like general enough in the definition of the high level components so that then I'm going to have enough uh, room, wiggle room to, to be more specific when specific problems arise, right? Because there's no way you're going to design the whole platform uh, at the get go. Right, it's mm -hmm. just impossible. And if you try to do that, well, please find yourself like another work because this this job is not for you. Because things are going to change quite a lot. So yeah. it's always a kind of like a it, it's a balance. It's a continuous balance between the the sort of like top down design needs as well as like the things that come out from the bottom. So what I try to do is to have like the highest level components or modules that I can think of, like for example, in a typical ML uh, pipeline, I would have like some sort of like configuration, some sort of like training, experimenting, some sort of like tracking, some sort of evaluation, deployment, saving, inferencing, and these kind of things. And then uh, depending on the needs, I would go down the level and build things that are a little bit more specific, right? Yeah. Are you working with primarily open source tools to yes. implement all that? Absolutely. This is like, I mean, as a philosophy, I come from open source and I think like open source, open knowledge and all of that is extremely important. But for me, more than that, I don't want to be locked into a, a service, right? A paid service. So tomorrow they can change something and then, I mean, everything like is going to, completely like change and and i know like that usually like with proprietary technology this is way this usually happens way more than in an open source project so there mm. like you know what's going on you know the direction of the project so you can also take measures if necessary but most of the time with proprietary tools frameworks and stuff like that that you don't have the extra luxury right and and i also feel I mean, I don't want to be locked in with a with a company again, right? So I want to have the, the liberty to, to move from one thing to another. And by the way, this also means that when you use some of these tools, and, and of course you're not just using the tools as infrastructure, but you're using like the, I don't know, like some SDKs, APIs or whatever, always remember to, 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 to wrap them into your modules into your classes, into 
something that you can abstract at a, a higher level because if things change tomorrow, they're not going to change everything, but just like that tiny little thing. Yeah, and this is something like that you just learn by doing it like quite a lot and getting it wrong like many, many times, like in your life as a programmer, not just yeah. as an MLOps engineer, right? And then you realize, yes, every time I do an import of a third-party library, well, I'm kind of getting married in a sense with that library, right? So yeah, I trust you, but not as much as to give you access to my precious uh, code base all around. You I'm going to just nuts. limit you yeah. down here <laughs> so that if you change your interfaces, if you change anything, I'm not going to have to go throughout the whole code base and change everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, man. Well, I think we can end it here. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Demetrius, for having me here. It's been a pleasure.